All right, welcome to this quick video. I wanted to show and uh, explain a uh, tool that you might find uh, coming in handy. I call this a, um, a signal strength recoder because it not only decodes uh, and encode, or it doesn't only decode, it encodes. Uh, so what this does, this little contraption, it's pretty compact, four wide tileable. It has to be A, B tileable because of these rails. So if you want to build a bunch of these right next to each other, you just have to swap between powered rails and activator rails uh, every other segment. And it's infinitely expandable as long as you can string the activation signals together. The way that this works is you have a signal strength input on this block here. As you can see, there's a comparator. And once you have your signal, let's leave it at one for now. You send an input pulse and it will pulse an output. Now you don't need this advanced timing or you don't need this, not really advanced, but you don't need this timing input uh, to have this work properly. Uh, all you need is to change the signal here in order to get a pulse out here. Um, however, I do have this construction here, uh, which allows me to store the last data value. So not only does this serve to recode a signal strength into binary, uh, it also allows you to store that value, and again, infinitely tieable, as long as you can tie together a um, the input signals. I originally wanted to build this uh, as a way to store a certain amount of data in music discs. And so I have a really simple mechanism here. So if you would want to store data, uh, this was introduced in 1.19.4. And in fact, uh, who was it? Who was it? Just one second. Uh, Mr. Korwalski uh, uses this method in his Redstone RAM system, which is 16 kilobytes in total by using, and it uses music discs to do so. So it allows for extremely compact um, data storage. So if I go ahead and look up music disk, what will happen is you can see that each one of these has a certain, I have it on the, um, on a data pack, not a data pack, a resource pack. Each music disk will actually output a certain uh, comparator output when taken from a jukebox. So if I go in here and I load this up, pulse once to load it into the hopper, then pulse a second time to get an output. You can see there's one, it'll go up to two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then after this, it'll go back to zero. This allows for you to store immense amounts of data in a sort of encoded binary form. Uh, two disks is eight bits, three bits is 16, because each disk has a signal strength output of zero to 15. And the way you emulate zero in this system is by using a uh, non-tileable, or uh, sorry, non-stackable item. I personally like to use wooden shovels because you can get three of them for the price of four planks. So one log will get you three shovels, which is absolutely perfect for resource management. I designed this also because I'm, de I'm designing a uh, computer system for, for a friend's server. So for practical computational redstone. So uh, let me show you how everything works. Uh, in order to get everything tileable, well, let's see. So you can see it's actually fairly simple how it all works. Um, so we have a red coder here that's custom designed for this one, for this machine. So if I go ahead and grab all that I need to grab, let me get some wheat, some torches, and some redstone dust. So this section here is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 blocks long. Uh, perfect. And so this is the top row, and underneath you're going to put down a comparator that is not in subtraction mode. 
And usually red coders will have a little ramp in order to have the uh, the signal strength change from, or to essentially subtract one for the red coder. Uh, but I ultimately decided on this because it was the only way I could figure out how to implement it. Uh, one other thing, for this bottom row, I built this wrong, you need to use slabs because uh, this thing over here, you don't want the red coder to interfere uh, with the uh, encoding of binary. So you need to make sure this is a row of slabs, full line of redstone, basically just building a red coder. And this needs to have its row of redstone as well. Get that built. Uh, the great thing about target blocks is they divert power, allows this to be so compact. Of course, this isn't a new discovery, but it's, it's still amazing to see. Once you've got that, slap down your row of repeaters. Like I said before, it's basically building a regular red coder. Get this slapped down. And then your last row of redstone torches. There we are. Red coder is constructed, except for one part. You're going to put redstone not facing anywhere like that. Put this here, this here. A redstone comparator on subtraction mode. And this is your input right there. You can see you need to power it. And this is your pulse. So whenever I press a button here, it will allow the signal to come through. And finally, for this top section to get this to work properly, you're going to need one more comparator, a composter, and make sure that the signal strength is on one. So one layer in the composter. That way, um, let me go ahead and turn this off for a second. That way, if I grab item frame, you can see one, two, one. And so it works like any regular red coder. Go all the way up to eight and back to one, just like that. Actually, you know what, I'll leave that in there. Go ahead and place this back. That's all we need of the composter. Uh, the next part you're gonna need is the encoder, and that's just constructed which a with a bunch of rails and a bunch of observers to send a pulse down to the next level. So if I go ahead and place my observers, you're gonna need two observers coming down like this all the way down, total of 32. Uh, it's a little pricey, however, it's very compact and it's tileable. So if you are going to be constructing computational redstone devices inside of Survival Minecraft, I'm sure that you'll have enough resources to build this. Let's go ahead and get this built up. And there we are. And so finally, the encoder into binary is fairly simple. Now, there's two ways you can go about it. You can do the think about it way or the find the pattern way. So if you think about it, we need this to output one whenever this is activated because this is the first signal strength. So this needs to output one. And so it just needs to pulse this, zero, 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 one. Then you could do, oh, there's two and there's three. But to the computationally inclined those of you out there, all you have to do is double the length of each segment every time. So like this, and then one, two, blank, blank, one, two, blank, blank, one, two, blank, blank, one, two. And this is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now, technically there is sort of a row here but um, because of the way this pulse system works, I did not add a, uh, a zero encoder, mainly because it would just be this, and that's it. So I got that. I just need to add one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and we're all done with this one. So what you need to do is go in, place down all your rails. Here, I'm going to go ahead and come back whenever I'm done with that. 
All right, that's all done. And so the last thing you need to do is capture this encoded output. And that's simply done by doing this. And the way that you can do it in survival is with a trap door and a, uh, and a block underneath you. That way you can crouch into the hole um, or you can build from the bottom up or you can just do this where you build one strip and one length of rail and that's it. And then finally, you're gonna need an observer in the middle because rails uh, run out of power faster than redstone lines. So make sure that that's in the middle. Build down one, oops, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And this comes down here. So there you are. I'll be back once this is all completed. And that section is all finished. And so now I'm going to explain uh, the reason that this data storage works the way it does. It has to do with quasi-connectivity and uh, what you might call quasi-connectivity and uh, block updates. So first I'm going to finish constructing this pulse segment because it will come in handy in just a second. Get this. You're going to need an input here of a four tick repeater. One, two, three, four. Get a piston placed right here facing up with an observer. Place a button where it can reach that piston. There's that. This, you're going to need a note block. And to get the timing right, you're just going to need a tower downwards of observers. I do believe it's just three and then a block at the end. Now, this data storage, I'll have to explain why it works. Um, whenever you have a setup like this, a dropper, this block is getting powered with a pulse and a rail right here. Essentially, what's happening is this dropper is being powered by this. However, because of the way Minecraft works, this dropper just doesn't know it. So if I just do this, you can see it doesn't update. Actually, hold on. Oh, I'm not getting any audio from this, am I? Oh well, it's fine. In the case that I am not, here is a better way to see it. If this dropper gets powered, you will see a light turn on. But this here, get myself a lamp. And so you can see whenever I click this, nothing's happening, right? It is not turning on this dropper, even though, but it is being powered through quasi-connectivity because technically it's trying to power this via the blocks around this one. So all it needs is to receive a block update from the rail. So if I power the both of these at the same time, uh, let's just do this, put this here, and put this here. You can see if I power them at the same time, it fires off. And so the best part is you can actually use that with an RS NOR latch. You can construct an RS NOR latch using this update, which actually technically can turn it into a D latch. Well, actually not technically, this is a D latch. And so what happens is all you do is you have your update signal, which is this one, and your write signal. And as long as they're synchronized, oh, let me change the way this works. Let me get this, this, and this, and this. Because every time this is powered, it's firing this update signal. So if I drop an item in here and update it, it's always pushing the item into this bottom dropper. However, if both are updated at the same time, it ends up pushing it into this top dropper. And if I disable this, it changes it back. And so that's what this is doing uh, every time you fire off. And the best part is 
it is tileable. Let me get this, two, three, four, and then place two, three, four, get uh, a line of observers facing downwards. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And finally, if I get an output out of all of these top droppers, uh, I should note one more fun little thing. A one tick pulse cannot power a comparator, which means that this signal, this pulse signal, isn't doing anything whatsoever. So if I go ahead and put a item, put an item in each one of these, just a junk item works fine. And I go ahead and pulse this. Nothing, or it go ahead and goes ahead and turns it off. Although I am missing something because this should have turned into one. Let's give it one more pulse to see if it's not something I did. I'll be right back with the troubleshooting to see what went wrong. All right, I found it. The simple solution was this. Um, this needs to be set to two ticks. I had it set on one. The one main issue with this is that everything has to be synchronized perfectly or it will not output correctly onto the data storage. But as you can see, every time I fire that update pulse, goes off without a hitch. Three, let's go ahead and do seven, or that's eight. Seven, there we are. There it is. Bring it up to eight. And back to one. Now, if you want to do something specific, uh, actually, you know what? Never mind. Uh, it was, I was going to say something about item frames, but it's not really necessary. Uh, just a little idea. But that's pretty much it. That's the basic tutorial on how to build it. Um, I'm sure that one of you out there will find a way to optimize this even more. Uh, but so far, this is a very uh, simple, relatively cheap signal strength recoding circuit. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope that this comes in handy for all y'all. See y'all later.